I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. Welcome to Season 10. To help get the season off to a good start, my guest this week is Anya Hindmarch, one of Britain's most celebrated fashion designers and a leading voice in the industry on sustainability. Anya started her business in London in 1987 and has 16 stores worldwide, as well as her own retail village in Pont Street, Chelsea. With the launch of her I Am Not A Plastic Bag totes in 2007, she helped kickstart a countrywide debate around single-use plastics. And this year, Anya is collaborating with leading supermarkets again to prevent plastics pollution. In 2017, Anya was awarded a CBE, and in 2019, she became a Greenpeace ambassador. Please welcome Anya Hindmarch to Cleaning Up. Before we start, if you're enjoying Cleaning Up, please make sure that you like, subscribe, and leave a review. That really helps other people to find us. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform, and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram to participate in the discussion. Also, you can visit cleaningup.live to access over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders, and you can subscribe to our free newsletter. That's cleaningup.live. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation. So, Anya, welcome to this first episode in season 10 of Cleaning Up. This is a conversation I've really been looking forward to. It's so nice to be with you. Nice to see you, Michael. Thank you for having me. So the way we always start is I ask my guests to describe who they are in their own words, because I've done a little intro, but I've probably got all sorts of things wrong and haven't given it the emphasis that you would give it. So who are you? <laughs> so it slightly depends day to day at the moment. Um, I suppose I, well, first of all, my, my name is Anya Hindmarch. I'm, I'm uh, British, even though I don't sound terribly British. Um, and I am a, I suppose, a fashion uh, designer. I'm a CEO of a company of a brand called uh, Anya Hindmarch. Um, but I suppose in this context, I'm a sort of slightly accidental um, environmentalist in a way. Um, and I spent much of my career rather by default has been devoted to projects that have been um, about sort of, I suppose, using my platform to discuss, um, you know, environmental issues. And uh, so, so that's become a lot of what I do. But uh, in my day to day, I also uh, make and sell um, rather beautiful uh, high end uh, leather goods and, um, and fashion accessories. And we sell those um, in many places all over the world. So that's what I do uh, normally. I'm also involved in the, uh, the Royal Marsden Cancer Charity as a trustee and a trustee on the Tate. So I've done lots of things in the art world as well. So you, you, um, you said you're a designer. You are also something of an, of an icon um, for your work on sustainability. So I'll confess, I'm not your kind of traditional target market, perhaps. But I did do some research and I asked a number of people who actually are your target market. And every single one of them owns some of your, uh, some of your products. And, and I asked one in particular, I said, why did you buy one of Anya Hindmarch's uh, pieces? And she said, instantly, she said, sustainability. She said, sustainability, that was the sell for her. So uh, uh, how much uh, does that resonate? I mean, is that, did you sort of hook the business to sustainability or was that the accident that you're referring to when you call yourself an accidental sort of spokesperson? It's very, very much an accident in a way, because I, mean, I started my business when I was 18. So I started designing then and um, making and selling products to stores and then opening stores and opening stores all over the world. So that's my kind of core business. Um, and it wasn't until 2007, which sounds quite a long time ago, but actually was quite a long time after I had started my business. I'm 55 now um, that um, we were approached um, to uh I suppose, amplify the message of, of a book that had just come out, which was trying to um, encourage people not to use single-use plastic. Um, and that really started a project which, uh, which led to four projects, really, and, I'm, and hopefully we can talk about them individually. But the first project was called I Am Not a Plastic Bag, uh, that, which led on to a project called I Am a Plastic Bag, uh, which then led on to a project called Return to Nature, which then led on to a project called Universal Bag. So these four projects have sort of scanned right through, um, you know, from 2007 to, to, to sort of 
current um, today. Um, so, so I very much fell into it, and 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 really, I was sort of passionate about it from the get go. I should I should I should caveat this with my father is a plastics was a well is a plastics engineer, so I've been brought up with plastic all my life. It's quite funny, really, given that so most of my career trying to to. Um, to sort of stop people using it but those those projects um it sort of started by accident but actually have become a real passion project for me um and i think i'm no expert i say that all the time and i'm far from perfect but what i do have in my own small way i suppose is a sort of a voice which you get in fashion fashion is a very powerful communicator you know it's very viral I and mean, it's amazing that fashion can make you wear your hair in one way one year and, you know, short trousers one minute and long trousers the next and and really persuade you to behave differently. And I think that's what excites me about um, the sort of place I have, if you like, to talk in this world from really with very little experience, certainly when I started, but with a voice to hopefully take people in a very honest, open and and perhaps easily understandable way. And that was why I was so much looking forward to this, other than it's always a pleasure to chat with you. Um, but, um, you know, I, I kind of know how businesses work. You know, I've built successful businesses. I've studied business. Uh, the things that I've done well have all been business to business. Uh, I've tried two business to consumer businesses, and they both failed. So I don't have that kind of what the Germans would call the fingerspitzengefühl, you know, the fingertip feeling for how do you actually sort of, I don't want to say manipulate, but how do you change people's behaviors? And I want to come back to that. I think that is pretty much at the heart of what we're going to talk about. But just to get the sort of bio piece a little bit fleshed out, how many yeah. years was it between you famously going to Italy, um, spotting a trend, starting to get some bags made and starting your business, aged, I think, 18, 19, um, and 2007, I'm not trying to ask you how old you are. I'm, I'm, I'll steer clear of that. So give us a kind of rough number, not an exact number. So, well, I'm 55 now. I started my business when I was 18 and I launched. So the business started in 1987. And the, the first project we did, um, environmental project we did, was in 2007. So quite a lot of years later. And obviously, when you're 18, there's a few years at your kitchen table trying to work out what you're doing and finding suppliers and dealing with all the things that business throws at you. But so it was quite a long time and very much my business is a fashion business that has um you know, like all businesses, in my opinion, now has to have at the heart of it, you know, a sort of responsible, I'm so bored of the word sustainable, but a responsible attitude to its supply chains. And I think that, you know, whilst it's very difficult, and I'm sure we'll talk about the elephant in the room, how do you square that circle of commerciality with being responsible? Um, and, you know, so it's very hard to be perfect, but I think you, you need to take people on that journey. People, people do care. They often don't care enough, but they do care. So that's the sort of time scale, and um, and and you know, there's been these four specific projects. Which I just did some mental arithmetic there, which was it's about 15 years that you were in fashion before something around that. I mean, it's 15, 20 years that you were doing fashion, and you were really not doing these environmental projects. Were you feeling? I mean, I'm, I'm very interested. Did you feel that kind of disconnect between? Presumably, you were already concerned about those issues or, or were you just blind to them no i wasn't i was i wasn't blind and actually when so with the very first project was um i'm not a plastic bag and happened because someone approached us who'd written a book which was um called um uh, save the change the world for a fiver the book was five pounds and in the book there were 40 actions of how to behave in a more responsible way and the first action in this book was wherever possible refuse plastic bags and they came to us because I kind of knew the person indirectly and they said would you help us amplify the message uh, of this book particularly around the plastic bags and I have one of those light bulb moments because I had been feeling um well I've been hearing the word you know the environment you know global warming and 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 you know lots of the been bits of of um uh, of kind of communication that has sort of come into my sphere and I was thinking what could I do as an individual and it was quite hard I've, I think we all felt a bit hopeless at that point um and so I suddenly realized actually I could use my platform of um bags and being a sort of spokesperson for bags as you say I'd already had 15 years of sort of working in that sphere so I, I had a voice for that and um and I felt I could actually sort of if you like sort of mimic the what was called the it bag formula in those days kind of a stupid idea but the, the, there was a huge sort of issue with um very fashionable bags the right people wearing them a sort of scarcity of supply and that becomes quite sort of exciting and and um and sort of viral and 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 people get quite you know quite 
excited about that. So I thought if I could produce a bag that was for five pounds, mimicking the book of Change the World for a Fiver, work with supermarkets, because I really wanted to go to the coal face where most of the sort of single use plastic was sort of coming from, uh, or certainly distributed, or a lot of it. Um, and actually, therefore, you know, we were making handbags that were many hundreds of pounds. So offering one of our bags designed by us for five pounds was quite intoxicating for the customer. And the aim was awareness. It was it was very simple. The aim was just look again. So we designed actually a, a cotton bag, which in fact, I look back on it now, it wasn't even sort of fair trade cotton or organic cotton. And, you know, all these things you, you learn as you go. And we launched it actually very initially with a few very, very high fashion stores. So, you know, Colette in Paris and some really kind of cool stores, limited amounts sold out immediately. And then we launched it with Sainsbury's, who are an incredibly brave partner, actually. And we've just partnered with them again, amongst other supermarkets, because, you know, that's quite a tricky place for them to sit you know they're offering something as an alternative but they were still offering the single-use plastic and they uh launched it in their stores i mean just to give you a sort of sense of the madness eighty thousand people queued uh, on launch day to across the country to buy one of the bags it became an absolute crazy sort of mad sensation um but what it did was was gain a huge amount of traction and coverage and press and it was the front page of many newspapers um we then took it around the world and it just got more and more and more crazy. Um, so it did absolutely communicate. I think one of my proudest things was the fact that I saw lots and lots of copies of these bags. And normally, obviously, as a designer, you don't want copies, but they were actually translating it into Mandarin and into Italian and into French and, and therefore communicating the message um, even further. The other thing that people mention when I say that I'm going to be talking to you on cleaning up is the sense of humor, the sort of cheekiness. You know, I'm not a plastic bag, and you've done you've done beer bag as uh, separately, and I think that was to do with your cancer uh, work, and uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, and then you, but then I am a plastic bag, and there's this kind of, and then just the the icon the, the iconography, which is the, the 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 cheeky face, the eyes, the way you know, the, the look, the brand, um, that use of humour has been pretty sort of central to what you do as well, has it not? Well, I think the thing is, in, in the world of, of um, environmental work and sustainability, so many, you know, brilliant and knowledgeable scientists, but they tend to lose the audience of, of the sort of, you know, the, the, the normal um, sort of customer and, and um, lay person. So I think that cutting through that with a bit of humor, to, which makes it a bit more engaging than perhaps just stats and facts, and actually taking people on that journey with the, the failures and the sort of open sourcing and the, you know, and I was very open, for example, when we did that first project, even I didn't know about, you know, how, you know, polluting and how thirsty the cotton crop is, for example, um, and actually explaining sort of saying, oh, I got that wrong and now I've learned. So I think just taking people on the journey with humor and kind of quite bite-sized and easy to kind of grasp communication is actually quite important to changing people's behavior. So. And perhaps we can add that through a sort of rather sort of fashion or perhaps sort of slightly humorous um, uh, sort of, um, you know, method. So perhaps that's why. But I think it's also what, what we do. We tend we don't take life too seriously <laughs> in what we do. And, the, and there's not that many people in the kind of net zero climate change, you know, just stop oil extinction rebellion or at the EU, you know, developing policy or working on the Inflation Reduction Act in the US. I mean, they're not sort of they're not getting the message across by wisecracking. That's for sure. Well, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think it can be. I think you need to do all things. It's so important, this, you know, this crisis that actually we need to do all things. We need to shock and we need to probably be a bit annoying. Um, but there are other groups who also need to take people on the journey and a sort of this could be really fun. Or, by the way, this is a much nicer way to do a better thing. And so I think we've always gone in that this is a much nicer way to do a better thing uh, route. And I'm, I'm not dissing other approaches because probably you need all of them, because if it's a bit annoying too, occasionally, perhaps that actually does um, also make people change their behavior because they want to avoid issues. But um, our approach has been one of actually, you know, come with us. We'll show you a nice way to do it. We'll inspire you. This is a beautiful thing. How about wear this? And actually, it's it's a, it's a better way of moving your stuff around. So that's been our approach. And it's not saying it's it's the right approach and it shouldn't be the only approach, but it's been one that's that's actually, I think, brought people on the journey in a positive way. I think we tend to be, well, I tend to be quite a positive person. Um, and I think that would be a much more natural way for us to communicate. And so I think it's important in the mix, honestly. 
Absolutely. There's, there are different roles and different communication styles that are appropriate uh, for each. I want to come back to some of the kind of trade-offs and some of the conundrums. But first, take us through, you've got those four projects. I mean, the first one, I'm not a plastic bag. And then there are these kind of almost riots uh, uh, as people queue and they're desperate to get hold of this. What was the, the, what was the journey then? Where did you go from there? And you know, we'll come back to the, the, the ideas that you've already put out there of not being perfect first time and learning and how you communicate changing behavior. But what was the actual journey? What were the, what were the steps? So after that first project, which was very much a baptism of fire and, you know, not for profit and just a sort of good thing to do, we, we it made a difference, actually. So whilst um, it had this incredible reaction, I mean, you know, I mean, 30 people went to hospital in Taiwan to give you a sense of, you know, obviously not proud of that. We stopped the project immediately after that, but it just got out of control, it went absolutely insane all around the world. So it got lots of attention. The message was carried further, as, as I suggested. It was. It, it then got some negative attention through the sort of lack of organic cotton. Um, but it was. It was great. And actually, the, the the figures from the British Retail Consortium, I think, were that the plastic bag consumption levels in the UK pre the project was something like ten billion, and it went down to six in a year. So it did. It did have a, a very real impact, which was fantastic. And as a consequence. Um, people started uh, imposing tax on carrier bags and so on. So that was great. And we went back to sort of our day jobs and felt we'd sort of done our bit there. Um, we'd obviously been involved in lots of things along the way. And, and But actually, it wasn't until 2020 when I just I looked around and someone told me the stat that I think there's something like 8 billion tonnes of plastic on the planet right now. And it just, I just thought, you know, this project is so not done, even though awareness has happened that 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 had done and i think our project contributed to that but actually we're, we're not done on this and obviously that the 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 issue has moved on to circularity there's all this plastic on the planet how can we keep it out of landfill and make it and reuse it so um so really um we you know really wanted to work back into the project but actually you know rather than i'm not a plastic bag actually i am a plastic bag so how could we reuse what's what's around and make something beautiful so we, we sort of delved into that project. So two years on R&D, actually, very expensive and complicated because actually it was sort of early into making, um, you know, PET plastic to recycle it, to source it, to work out how to use it. Every every bolt of fabric when it first arrived was a different width and, and weight and, you know, dealt differently with the, the way that we, we manhandled it, which made the production incredibly complicated. So it was really two years of, of hell. In fact, even as we launched it, we were worried that actually it was, you know, it was quite fraught with difficulty. One of the things that happened also, we developed a, a fabric, which was recycled PET, which behaved so much like a beautiful cotton canvas drill that it actually got dirty which actually wasn't very, you know, we have to make things that our customers want as it doesn't work. So we ended up putting a coating on it like you might on a cotton canvas, but obviously we wanted that to be recycled as well. And we managed to find um, PVB, which is actually the plastic that is between windscreens that holds the glass together so it doesn't smash, and to repurpose that and save it from landfill and actually use that as a coating. And again, that was very different because obviously different windscreens and different temperatures, and <laughs> it was really quite a head fry getting the whole thing done. But anyway, we, we got there and... Um, that actually also made me think quite a lot about leather. Um, and so just to say also that when we launched that project, we, we actually slightly as part protest and part art installation, closed all of our stores, all of our London stores, um, and actually filled them, took all the product out and filled the stores to the brim, to the ceiling, with 90,000 used plastic bottles to connect people to what it looks like, which I think is something like six minutes of landfill, because I think also part of the communication piece is, is people need immediate bite-sized attention grabbing messages. And actually when you see six minutes of landfill, and, and we literally had lorries, we collected all these bottles ourselves, which is probably why we all got COVID in the process, by the way, we launched this in, the, in, the, in 2019. Um, but when you see a store fill, it's so disgusting and it's so, ridiculous and I always say that's that wonderful that someone once said to me if you had to actually plant or bury everything that you take sort of waste in your own garden you'd actually just stop taking it you know you'd, you'd stop it at source and so actually seeing it there and actually being connected to it it's one of the things I care passionately about actually which is that we need to get children to visit landfill sites and we need to get children to to visit um recycling centers just to make them realize you know when you throw something away there is no away you know the thing we we all know but anyway, that project, which was, again, incredibly powerful from a communication um, point of view, we toured it around the world, we've done lots of projects, and we filled up stores in, in Japan and in Hong Kong with bottles. We, we sort of really sort of made, made a point. Um, 
also made me think about leather because we we actually had thought about trimming the bag in a recycled leather to tie in with the fact that the whole project was about recycling. And when we dug into to leather, recycled leather is basically the bits of old leather mashed down and then remixed in a sort of soup of plastic. <laughs> so actually recycled leather is not the answer. We then looked, of course, at vegan leather, which is just is just plastic. It's just, you know, what people used to refer to as um, leather in those days. Um, and actually, we started looking into leather because leather has such a bad name that I started looking into it again and realizing that leather actually is the most amazing material. Um, so we, we actually ended up using leather that was really, really well sourced. But the point of explaining this is it actually led me to the next project, which was called uh, Return to Nature, because I then thought, actually, in waste is or in nature, there is no waste. In nature, there's no need for landfill. You know, you don't see a dead dog in landfill, do you? It actually, like an apple, it falls from the tree. It actually, you know, it biodegrades, it composts, it adds nutrients to the soil and it actually benefits soil health. So could we actually make, and you know, I sort of set myself the question, could I make a bag that would behave like nature so that actually at the end of life, if you actively composted it, that it would actually break down and benefit soil health, leaving nothing nasty and actually nourishing the soil to support further growth. So we set out on this project, which was another two years of R&D, and by the way, very expensive R&D, um, and actually worked with a number of people and, and a huge amount of trials to look at how you source responsible leather. And there's a whole book in that subject, um, you know, and that means it has to come because actually cattle are very good for soil as long as it's a healthy, you know, regenerative farm. Um, how you then tan leather responsibly. Um, so we work with a number of amazing people that I sort of discovered and sort of quite an iterative process really through the project. So people who, where you can source skins that um, have, you know, have, have the uh, animals with the best animal we welfare. And we work with an incredible company um, called Scanhide, working with amazing um, experts in tanning, Hoffman's and finishing, finding a way to tan the leather using no uh, heavy metals, no chrome, no, um, no nasty stuff, basically, so that it left nothing in the soil uh, when it broke down. So we actually worked with zeolite, which is actually a form of clay, uh, to, to naturally tan the skins. And then finishing the leather, it's so interesting, when you dig into leather finishing, pretty much all leather these days is coated in plastic, a thin film of PVC. So the reason you don't have to polish your shoes anymore, as we used to when we were children, is because actually they have this sort of, you know, bulletproof coating of plastic on the outside. And the reason you never, your trainers stay white and get, don't get sort of dark with rain is because they're basically leather with a lot of plastic coating on them. So it's quite horrifying when you think about it. So we set out to try and find a different way to protect the leather. Because if you don't protect the leather, you need to find a way to have a barrier because otherwise it, it gets very wet and, and, and breaks down immediately. So um, we found this amazing people. It's a company called Evolved by Nature who have this product which is activated silk. So essentially it's liquid silk. Because actually silk is one of the best natural polymers actually it's very interesting i mean nature has it all nature has things that do this and that it's all part of a circular economy essentially so it, it it's naturally breaks down so we work with them to to find a way to have the finishing of the leather the protection the final barrier coating um made out of liquid silk um and in fact we needed a tiny top up of wax in the end we actually got to the stage where we we're just about to launch this beautiful product totally we passed all the tests it did biodegrade it did compost and I went out in severe rain, uh, in severe rain, just testing the product. The product ended up with a bit of chicken pox because the, the water was getting through the, the, the silk. So we ended up finding this amazing family in the UK. You have terrible allergies. So they had to remake all the natural products you use in a house um, without any nasties in it. And we, they had this one wax that we use as the final belt and braces coating on the top of the liquid, the, the liquid silk um, to actually stop the rain getting in. So it was such an amazing journey. And, and we worked obviously all the way through testing this and externally auditing it to make sure that we knew it would actually biodegrade and compost. Uh, and so it was independently tested. But we had a lovely moment at the very end where um, we had the compost that had the leather in it. And we grew a control set of plants and, and another set of plants to test alongside. And the control set without our compost delivered plants that grew with 20 percent shorter. So our little compost delivered our little plants, which were 20 percent stronger um, with our with our leather composted into it. So it was an amazing moment to, so, to show really that you can produce beautiful fashion products that a very sophisticated customer 
would love um, that are that are manageable to make um, and actually that could never end up in landfill. So that was, I mean, it's a slightly academic project, but I really wanted to prove that. We still sell that product very well today. Um, and, and it was a, a, an amazing, very expensive, but great R&D journey, which I think sparks, I hope, a lot of conversations in the way that anyone is, is doing product development and, and, um, and new product development in fashion. So, so at a garden center near you, you'll now be able to buy one of your handbags as the most expensive fertilizer in the world, because it, never mind the handbagging, it actually <laughs> we did uh, delivers 20% more plant growth. I think we do have a business in compost, don't you think? I think that's the way for compost, by the way, is the most fascinating subject. But anyway, we won't get into that now. But it, it, it's very, very interesting. So people got scared thinking that the bags might sort of actually break down and, and compost and sort of um, or break down uh, on their shoulder. But, you know, you, you have to actively put it with compost. But no, it's a, it's a really interesting project. And, um, and I think, you know, sparks lots of conversations. What I find fascinating about th those stories is that you have actually... You've done, you, you focused on the research because that's the bit that you see and it's the bit that you have to pay for. But you're also developing a supply chain because there's all these companies out there that, that are doing bits that individually don't add up to, you know, a lot. But actually they are, because it's an interesting question about the circular economy. I think a lot of people think that the circular economy happens within one company. So you've got recycling, which everybody knows is a sort of chain, like a, a, it's a relay race, a baton race. But circularity, I think a lot of people think it's about one company that has to be circular, but it's not. It is actually still a baton race. It's still a supply chain and there's still all sorts of elements to it. And that's what was so exciting about this project, actually. And actually, in preparation for this call, I listened, actually, we did, I did a, I interviewed all the people involved, all those individual partners, all of whom we discovered, you know, by speaking and researching and so on, and some failed and some did. And we put them all together on a call. And actually, I listened to the, to, I, I did a sort of interview with all of them, because it was such a, a really exciting moment when we finally got that little plant, plant growth, you know, that was the final exam result, if you like, of all the work. And they're all really interesting people. And I think it's joining those dots and having projects you can pull together all those experts and pull it together for a result is really exciting. I think the most important thing then is to share that very openly. And that's the one thing I'm passionate about because normally in business, you you know, you spend all this time researching and finding your, your trusted supply chain and you guard it with your life. And I think one of the big shifts actually in, in business now is, is transparency. And it's very hard because it hurts a bit as a, you know, when you put a lot of money and effort and resource into it. But I feel that's the one thing that we really need to do. And I, I've tried to really kind of just push through that. And just so, and hence, if you, if you look on our website, you see it's very open on who did what and who and how we do it. And everyone's, um, you know, part of the process. So I think that transparency piece is, is a sort of more modern way of doing business. And that is a sort of definite shift. And I definitely see how that is part of the whole net zero uh, transition or not just net zero but environmental responsibility um, because you know you, now there will be no doubt conferences amongst those sort of you know good suppliers the suppliers that get it they will sell a bit better they will meet each other there will be conferences there will be exhibitions there will be shows there will be sections in the fabric um, annual messe in Germany or in Italy wherever it, wherever and then you're going to have to innovate more to stay ahead of that. And that's really how the kind of tipping points happen, isn't it? It is, it's hard because, you know, we put two, I think two and a half years for each of those projects I've spoken about in R&D. Every time we tested a, another thickness of that liquidated silk versus the wax, how did it affect the leather? What did the rain do? Actually, is the tannage a little different? Is the more zeolite? Actually, is the thickness of the natural material, the skin, different anyway? Every time we did that, and then every time that had to go to the external auditors to check, is it actually compostable? Is it actually biodegrading? Is it meeting the requirements? It was another £3,000. I cannot tell you how much money we kept sort of, you know, applying into this, these projects. So it's quite hard to then kind of go, guys, this is what we did. And then people can jump straight to the sort of, you know, the, the chase and, and, and produce products that have the same, uh, use your R&D. But I think it's important. I really, it's the one thing that I've, 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 I've sort of, even though it's commercially a little bit kind of, you know, hurts a little bit, I think it's key. And that's why I think also, if you're very open and honest about what you've done and share the journey with people, people also they have a bit of loyalty and respect for for your brand because you're 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 going out on a limb. You're putting your money where your mouth is, and you're 
taking them on a very honest journey. I think I think that's that's well received by your customers. So that I think is the shift actually with this, especially with the next generation. They 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 um they repay you, if you like, for the pain. And I think that's where they're very loyal to a lot of these brands. I think Patagonia is a great example of that, where they're very, you know, they're very sort of front and center on, on, on what they do and, and share that journey. And people are very loyal as a result. So whilst it feels a bit sort of, um, uh, you know, it feels a bit counterintuitive, I think that actually it's the right thing to do. And actually, interestingly, the, the customer does actually repay that loyalty. They're very loyal um, and, and repay you back. Um, so it's interesting. No, and, and very clearly, it has worked for you because, as I say, when I asked why buy a Hindmarch bag, then the answer was sustainability. So people can copy the sustainability, mm -hmm. but they can't copy necessarily. I mean, the brand is much harder to catch up with. But So that's talking about influencing the supply no, chain. To that point, but I was just going to interrupt you rather really, apologies. But just to that point, it's interesting because I, I talk a lot about brand, obviously, because it's what I do. But I always think people talk about brand um, as a sort of, you know, there's all these sort of mantras and taglines and, and mission statements. But actually, brand is behavior, isn't it, ultimately? And I always think that actually um, that's all that matters. That's what people experience. And that little patchwork of a thousand examples of touch points with, with a company and a brand and their values actually are more important than anything. So I, I do think it's, it, um, you know, that's, that's a very overused word, brand, but it's actually behavior that counts. And actually, I was going to switch to behavior um, at exactly that point, because I was going to make the I was going to acknowledge that you have influenced the supply chain and you have influenced your competitors, because if they copy you, then that is influence. The behavior at the consumer of the consumer, though, um, that you brought up, um, I, I, I guess that I, I'm starting to sort of ask questions about, OK, this all sounds marvelous. What percentage of consumers and what percentage of their behavior are you really accessing? Because what you've done is tremendous, but then the question is, to what extent does it really kind of change the world or, or have, a, have a, a large scale impact? Um, not yet, I think it's fair to say, but I think that what happens is that um, if if I demand if my if I can make my customer interested in uh, or make customers interested in buying the right thing, then they demand that of their of where you know of their their brand they're buying from. I think it also goes further up in the supply chain because you know if if people I mean Selfridge did a brilliant job where they just banned any exotics very very early on and um, and have been very strict about what they buy and as a consequence every supplier to Selfridge is suddenly rushing around trying to find an alternative so they're going to all their supply chains and kind of going can you produce something that doesn't have X Y and Z in it so actually you can make a difference all the way up the supply chain um, I think I mean you know. The, the reality is also we need to keep businesses healthy and to be selling things because actually we all know that doing the right thing slips down anyone's agenda if, if people are struggling, cost of living and so on. So, we, you know, there's, there's all of those those pushes and pulls. But I, I do believe that even if it doesn't have an immediate huge effect, it it, it has a, you know, it, it is viral and, and we have to do it anyway. There's no, there's no, no option as far as I'm concerned. But I, I think, you know, all the projects we do, make a difference they might just communicate they might change people's behavior with you know to, to to reuse some plastic bags they might um make people think you know it might spark a big brand like nike to go well actually could we make a product that can never end up in landfill i mean that would be a great result and i hope it actually also makes my customers like our brand and, and buy our product more and i mean it, it actually led to the the fourth project that that i've sort of worked on more recently which i wanted to go back to the supermarkets because you know, I think ultimately that's probably where I can have the most effect. And I think that that sort of magic thing of someone who normally sells something in a very expensive price point and, and making it very accessible to widely, it, there's a magic to that, which can have quite a quite a um, an impactful um, benefit. So we, we launched this thing called Universal Bag, where we wanted to work with all the supermarkets, which is quite an ambitious project. And I, I do believe in that, um, you know, eco, not ego thing. And um you know, going to, therefore, uh, we've worked with Sainsbury's, Waitrose, uh, we've launched Co-op, we've just launched Tesco, um, and, and the many one time which have launched and which haven't yet launched, so I don't put my foot in it. But we're working across not only the UK, but also across the world, which is launched in Hong Kong, just launched in Japan. We're just talking to every country across huge supermarket players um, to launch a bag that is um, fully made from recycled, 100% recycled materials. Um, that is um, also guaranteed for 10 years. It, it, I suppose that the, the way to explain it is that um, bags for life are not for life. 
and actually that it's not working and it's ending up apparently I think people take a bag for life every two weeks so clearly it's it's broken and you see them sitting in hedgerows and it's a disaster and as a result people are making heavier thicker plastic to last which is not being used for a long enough period so um we wanted to try and tackle that problem and the the result is a bag therefore that is 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 last 10 years is fully recycled has a very clever recyclable sort of element mechanism to it which is there's a pocket inside and at the end of life hopefully after 10 years or more you would fold it back into the pocket and it has a name and address free post address and you just put it in any post box and it comes back locally to be recycled locally um, but more than anything as well it actually is inspiring people because it's a nice bag which many of the bags for life are not it's inspiring people to want to use something for a longer period of time so whether they're using it for the you know the picnic at school or their kids sports stuff or whether they're using it as I was to lug stuff from you know the the, the car to the to the house or food or whatever it is um, it, it's it, it inspires this reuse attitude so we, we've really launched this with all the supermarkets and again it's been a massive success this is meant to be a permanent project uh, and it's having quite significant um, reach actually and engagement so again I think it's doing it's doing lots of different things but but taking it very much to if you like to the masses and that resonates because I started, I tried to use bags for life and I got to the point where I realized that they weigh sort of 20 times as much and I only use them five times and then something, you know, and, and so it's clearly not the solution. So that's a great project. But I want to come back to this business about the extent to which you can change the consumer behavior. Um, and um, the bag, your bag that's got the liquid silk requires more care mm. than the equivalent sort of sprayed mm. with plastic leather bag and you know are you finding people sort of mm. you know happily doing that or do some people say well I don't want to be polishing my bag I don't, didn't enjoy polishing my shoes when I was a kid why would I enjoy polishing a bag and and you know how, can you really take not just a few people who really love the idea and love what you're doing but can you take can you take everybody with you on that sort of journey I think you can with the right communication. It becomes a badge of honour. I mean, I was talking to someone this morning about um, ink pens, funnily enough, because, you know, we used to all be given an ink pen for our 21st birthday. And I, you know, was so excited to get the ink pen of my dreams. And now everyone is using, you know, just disposable pens and pencils. I mean, it's shocking if you think about it. And I, it's, you know, as bad as water bottles, really. Um, so we need to make it a beautiful thing that you enjoy refilling your ink pen. You enjoy the beauty of a, you know, the craftsmanship of an ink pen. And it becomes something that's, that's that's cool because I think this is where fashion has a a very big part to play that if someone you really admire is carrying a beautiful ink pen uh, and you know a, a really nice uh, reusable bottle it, it's it, you know you want to be like them and we've seen how fashion works we see how it's you know literally someone wears a pair of you know flares one minute and everyone's suddenly copying them and doing that so it really can work um, so I think it can have a, a massive benefit in answer to your question I think it can it can deliver but the fashion industry, there's the fashion industry and there's there's fashion and the fashion industry, just clothing, it's 2.1 gigatons of carbon emissions. It's about 4% of all the emissions in the world. And not that much of that probably comes from, you know, Hindmarch bags or, 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 or Louis Vuitton you know, the vast majority of it is just people who just need clothes. And it's, you can call it fast fashion, you can call it convenience, you can call it people buying clothes for their kids, and their kids then six months later, or just, you know, grow out of it, or it's, or it falls apart. Um, you know, is it realistic? To, I, I, you know, I held up my pen when you were talking about the fountain pen, because I think the pens need to be things of beauty. <laughs> so I agree with you. But, yeah. but, the, but that's a minority sport, you know, most people are not, you know, they're just not in a position. I mean, you know, apart from the fact that the that most people on this planet live, you know, in Asia and have relatively modest means, and they're not buying products that are be of great beauty that will last ten or fifteen years. They're just trying to sort of, you know, I don't want to say live hand to mouth. You know, hopefully the majority are beyond that, but they're not buying because of their sort of environmental uh, credentials, are they? No, but I think the huge and disgusting overconsumption is not actually mostly because someone needs a new T-shirt, unfortunately. I think there's many, many too many T-shirts on the planet as, as it is. Um, it's because actually they're driven 
because of fashion and, and everyone else's behavior that they need new, they need to look a different way, they need the latest. So if you in fashion can influence that, I think you can make a difference. Um, and, you know, I'm realistic. It's very, it's not, I'm as a one woman person, it's not going to happen by me. But I think if, if, if you can, you know, and you do see it in these sort of absolute sort of mega huge celebrities, massive followings, if they post something saying, actually, I'm going to wear this, this dress, I love this dress, I'm going to wear it for its 40th time. How cool is that? If you make that call, frankly, that's a relief to everyone. I think there's overconsumption, there's endless need to have new, new, new. It's actually it's disgusting and it's expensive and it's exhausting for everyone. So we need to buy less and buy better. You know, that is, and we need to rent and we need to buy secondhand. My kids now buy all their clothes secondhand. They barely buy anything new. So that is absolutely a trend amongst their age group. So I actually think that we can make a real difference, actually. And I think fashion has a big part to play um, because it, it's actually unsustainable, frankly, for people's pockets to keep buying new. So I think you can look at it in a slightly different way. But you have got influencers that are reusing and they become, they come under intense scrutiny. You know, uh, Princess K, uh, if a reuse, oh, you know, did she wear that once before? And, uh, and, and, and so on. And that can have quite an impact but it can also open up you know just the use of celebrities at all can also open up the trend of you know trying to be more responsible to it um you know calls it hypocrisy because the next thing that she does is jump on an airplane uh, for sure for sure but i think though that um you know I mean, the, the idea of an influencer or um in fact celebrity the word brings me out in hives to a certain extent so but it's about who who might influence and who is responsible to use to influence um but frankly even if it's irresponsible and it makes a difference to to a minority uh, and it's contradictory five minutes later if it makes a difference so what let's use them you know i really don't care i'm not proud i i think we need to i think I mean, how lovely was it in COVID when, you know, you were sitting on a Zoom call and not having to buy another dress because no one saw what you're wearing below your waist anyway. You know, it actually was quite a relief. I think this overconsumption thing is is driving everyone to, it's crazy. And even with my business hat on and trying to grow my business and being responsible to shareholders and so on, as we have to do, and by the way, employing people who then have money to keep it at the top of their agenda. So I'm, I'm really defend economic success. We need to make sure that's really important because it helps, it helps, um, us do good stuff in the environment. Uh, even despite that, I think we can actually make people buy fewer things. If you're going to buy seven t-shirts in a year, actually buy three that are well-sourced, good cotton, responsibly made. So I think you can actually keep the same, you know, revenue, but actually just actually, you know, change the way that we do it. So I think there's, there's ways through all of this. It will take a long time uh, and you chip away at it, chip away at it. But I really believe there is a, a solution that could make 20% difference. I mean, 20% difference would be significant, right? How do you deal with criticism that you're kind of, you're almost trying to sort of sell your way to degrowth or you're, you know, you're, you're, that you're maintaining a system which is fundamentally just unhealthy? Well, degrowth, if you're talking from a business point of view, so you're talking about unhealthy from a business point of view, I think what I just no, said no, is if you, you know, if you're buying seven t-shirts, no, is that what you're saying? So what I was thinking more was that the whole edifice of fashion and the way we use uh, clothes to signal status or, or, or in crowdness or you know, that just the whole thing. You're actually propping up an industry and a cultural phenomenon which is just fundamentally bad for the planet and cannot be, cannot be made somehow good for the planet. But one also has to be pragmatic here because the fact is people do need clothes. They will buy more clothes than they need. So how can you encourage them? To make to make a difference to where we are now even if we just start by saying okay we can't change everything overnight and that's unrealistic uh, and all those reasons you just said about you know in crowd and, and status and and, and self-expression i mean i love fashion for that reason for me it's part art form and part tribal it's you know fascinating um but the fact is if we can make everyone behave differently not to damage businesses as i've said but to actually just make even if they make five fifteen you know 20% difference to the way they consume, that's significant. And it, it's interesting, once you start, I mean, I, I did a big project where um, we talked about plastic in bathrooms and said, you know, if you just start with your bathroom and think about how you, you know, how you take shampoo, you know, every time you take another plastic bottle of shampoo, how about you have one, you refill it. And there's some really interesting brands now where you can refill, in fact, the, the milkman here, you can leave out um, milk bottles and they will fill it with shampoo or conditioner or laundry liquid or you know so it's actually really cool so if we can make that um, 
cool and fashionable and a good way to behave, um, we can make quite a big difference. And if, if we just look at small incremental differences, once you start, it's about like you go to the gym. If you start going to the gym, you actually then start eating better. And it's sort of, it's, it's, it's quite effective. So I think that's not bite off more than we can chew. Let's just try and make some differences and try and make people think differently. It, it leads to all sorts of good things. So I'm quite a believer in this idea of incrementalism, partly because I spent so much of my career tracking learning curves, tracking the building of those supply chains. And there are these tipping points where things take off. And I guess the question is whether those small things, though, will add up to a sufficient enough change. And, you know, you talk about the shampoo bottles and so on. You know, I'm reminded of these hotels that say, you know, we're very sustainable, you know. Um, only we'll only replace the towels if you put them in the bath and we and we don't use little bottles we use bigger bottles and then you know you arrive and yeah. there they are with their sort of um you know their, their their gas heaters heating up the entire patio outside the hotel um with with, with gay abandon they just you know clearly have no clue about real deep sustainability and the whole idea of traveling is probably sort of bad for the planet inherently I know. But listen, we have to be realistic because if we get to the stage where we make everyone feel so guilty that they then they'll just they'll just zone out. Right. And so and the fact is, people you know need to live and need to do what they need to do. Let's just try. And and I know, and I know there's a massive crisis. Don't get me wrong. I'm not belittling that. But we're not going to get people to go from to, from A to Z in, in one go. We, we have to just encourage and inspire and use our platforms and do whatever we can to make as much difference as we can. And I, I think I mean, one of the things I would love to do that I think could be significant in fashion is I would love there to be a sort of traffic light system uh, in the way that there is on food. You know, you get calories and, and nutrition and you get, you know, absolute clarity of, of, um, of uh, supply chain and sort of uh, ingredients. I would love in fashion, if you're going to buy a T-shirt, that it had a red or a green or an amber light on it in terms of actually how well is this source. And I think that if we could introduce that into fashion, that would be really helpful because in the same way that I said about leather, there's so much misconception around um, leather because, you know, people talk about it as it's, you know, the worst thing ever. And it, it, it's really not. Actually, in many cases, it's actually the most sensible. And I always talk about sense, common sense. It's one of my big sort of northern stars. But it's actually the most sensible and responsible roots. Uh, and certainly vegan leather is, is not. So I think if there was a way of showing this is good leather, this is actually from a regenerative farm. It's, you know, locally sourced, sensibly and responsibly tanned um, and versus leather that actually is incurring deforestation and, you know, making the soil like a desert, um, you know, you, you, you need to know the difference because actually otherwise it's just it's just one size fits all and it's very confusing for the consumer. So I think then that would be helpful. So I, I also believe that I think we need a bit of sort of, you know, tax, carbon tax on products actually, unfortunately, eventually as well. So it's going to be all sorts of things we need to do. But um, if, if that combination can, can lead to a change in behavior, um, that's, that's, that's um, imperative in my view. So I'm, um as you're talking about, you know, traffic light system, you know, red, orange, green, uh, I'm a data guy and I'm thinking about how you would do that. Also for a carbon tax, you've got to have really robust data. And the problem with this is it's just incredibly complicated. So if you have red, orange, gr uh, green, or red, amber, green, and, you know, one person is going to care about, um, you know, uh, carbon one person is going to care about recycling one person is going to care about um beetles one person has just read something about methane emissions one person is worrying more about labor and labor conditions and fairness uh, somebody else is worrying about heavy metals and, and it just becomes the trade-offs and the complexities to boil things down to red amber green I, I'm not sure it's doable. I, 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 I'm scared by that. No, I think, no, I think you're right. I'm not that's the answer. Yeah. And I also think it's incredible. It's a huge burden for business. So it, I, I sort of raise it as a, you know, could it just simply be that it, you have to say how much carbon this product has, has you know, the, the sort of carbon impact, for example. So I don't know the answer yet, but I, I do think that actually if the customer had some some you know transparency that was that was regulated and that was consistent it would help people make informed decisions i think it's very difficult as a consumer honestly so i think we're not very sophisticated in in, in that way um and you know you data guys will have to work out how we do it and how we make it doable and how it doesn't become too burdensome for business because you know that's that's expensive but i i do think that and, and, you know, right now with cost of living and everything people are, are you know, juggling and we do need to keep people employed. I, th I also really think that's a really important thing to balance. We need businesses to be healthy right now. Um, 
But I think that if we could crack that in a way, and maybe it's just starting with one aspect, it wouldn't be perfect, and then it gets better and better. I'm sure there, there were a lot of discussions, you know, when they introduced all the the, the, um, the labelling that was required on food. But I, I sort of feel it's, you know, people forget, by the way, that fashion comes from farms, that it's grown. It's, it's, it's very interesting. People just, when you say that to people, they just kind of look at you in a sort of weird way, but everything that we wear and carry comes from a farm that it is grown. So I think it's not wrong that we treat fashion in the same way that we treat food. Well, unless it comes from petrochemicals, technically, because a lot of the plastic, uh, a lot <laughs> yes. of the uh, synthetic <laughs> fabrics do. <laughs> but behind this idea of labelling, there is a thesis that people act on information. And I slightly worry about that because, you know, frankly, you've probably got clients who think of, and I'm going to pick it up on my next trip to New York or to Miami, and they're going to fly, and everybody knows. Yeah. We know, we've told people how many times. Yeah. The single worst thing you can do is jump on an aeroplane. What do people do? Jump on an aeroplane. Yeah. And yeah. so at some yeah, point, yeah, yeah. the information alone, I think that what you talk about, the brand yeah. and its translation into behavior is probably more yeah. where the secret lies rather than just my data businesses, right? Yeah, but I think it's where, I mean, I'm throwing it out there just because, I, again, in the same way, I don't know the answers, but, you know, if you throw it out to clever people through a podcast, someone might go, actually, what we could do is. Um, and um, and I, I think it's worth chucking these things out. We all need to kind of grab the bits we think we can make a difference with. Um, but I, I just know as a customer that I would like to know if I'm in, you know, I don't know, Regent Street buying something, I'd like to know how far it's traveled. I know how far I've traveled, so I can, you know, I, I, hopefully I can be sensible about that. But just some facts. And I think it would help people make informed decisions. I think it's a sort of missing link. So I'm not saying it's simple, but I think there's something there that, that would be really helpful. Uh, and of course, I mean, you know, responsibility and travel, and it's just such a hard one to, 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 you know, I mean, the only response way to behave is pretty much to stay at home and grow your vegetables outside your window and not move anywhere. And that's a bit unrealistic, isn't it? As we discussed once before. <laughs> I also think it's not just that that is unrealistic. It is also that it won't actually avert disaster because we'll just slow down the economy, but we're not going, it's only through the innovations that we'll actually turn the super tanker and end up somewhere else rather than the same destination, but just a bit slower. So I think the innovation is all about, I want to come back to one final, I don't know if you'd consider this your fifth sort of major uh, sustainability project, but you've sort of returned to your roots in Pont Street and you're creating um, this uh, uh, almost a complete experience between the different sort of uh, Anya Heinmarsh things that you can do, activities, shops, and so on. Um, is that the sort of next embodiment of, of the sustainable experience rather than thinking of it as a product? Well, I think local, well, so yes, I mean, it's, it's a long story, but localization is interesting to me. We've opened this, what we call the village, which is sort of six stores and a cafe. And we used to have sort of 65 stores around the world. And, and I very much wanted to actually bring it back to roots. It's a longer story tied into me buying my business back and so on. So there's several different threads to it. But I think that localization thing is important. And I also do agree that experience over things is, is very um it's kind of what I want, actually. I, I, I've got too many things. And obviously, I know I make things and sell things. But I, I naturally am being drawn towards selling experiences, coupled with things sometimes and sometimes not. And, you know, the very fact that we've got 150 people queuing from nine o'clock in the morning every day outside a shop in Pont Street to um, currently buy ice cream, uh, very unusual ice cream, I suppose, is testament to the fact that I think that is that's actually what people want. Um, I think we all have too much stuff. I think we all feel guilty about it. It's quite suffocating. It's, it's a huge amount of money and memories are very precious. No one can ever take your memories from you. So I think there is a movement towards that. Uh, and I think that's very exciting. So I did do some um, market research into the ice cream flavors as well. And uh, I believe I understand one of them is ketchup <laughs> flavor, which, um, which played to somewhat, um, uh, well, the, the, basically the grown-ups thought it was awful and the kids thought it was great fun. Well, interestingly, you'll find that when you taste it, the grown-ups think it's rather delicious and the kids find it not quite sweet enough. Um, so it, it's been working with this amazing um, Devon um, small batch ice cream maker. We've, we've come up with these flavors, which are very unusual. So, for example, soy sauce, uh, which is, you know, actually a toasted sesame, quite umami, delicious, quite sophisticated flavor. There's Branston pickle, which is, you know, as you imagine, it's got lots of sort of fruits. And um, there's uh, digestive biscuit, lemon curd. There's... Um, 
Ribena, it's all sorts of amazing flavors, but it's a fun experience because it's just unlikely. Um, and I think, you know, your point about experience over things is, is really is another way to solve this problem. It's going to be lots and lots of things coming together. But I also I'm with you that I think it's going to be some massive R&D into some incredible technology discovery that is really going to help us here because I'm kind of worried that we're running out of time frankly so everything we need to do we should but I think we need some we need the economy to be sat the economy to be sound so we can afford that the big R&D and just on your Pont Street on the village do you also um, focus on the materials the building materials because you know you're you're stripping out and you're renovating stores you've been doing that for your your whole career since your first store that you opened in Pont Street um, do you now look at the circularity of absolutely everything in the store, the glass, the, 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 when they lay the floor slab, the furnishings, everything? Or is that kind of a next frontier? I think this is, by the way, so interesting because when we had 65 stores, you know, you, we had a, a design Bible and you'd go into a store and you'd strip it all out and all that lovely, the previous sort of incumbent, it all went and you put in your, you know, and you were sourcing stuff and it's just so disgusting. Um, and actually, that's why I wanted less stores. I want to bring it right down. And actually, what we're working with is what's there. So, you know, those are beautiful old very old shops. And yes, there's an element of new, but we try and source it locally. But actually, you need to put in shop fits that work that you can change and alter. And, and what we were doing prior to, to the village also is we were doing these very big shows during Fashion Week, where, you know, we would put on these massive sets, proper huge, like sort of theatre level sets, for what is essentially nine minutes of, of show. Yes, admittedly, that the kind of content would distribute around the world. But that felt so wasteful, even if we recycled the materials afterwards, it just felt wasteful in every respect. So what's lovely about the village for us is it replaces not only the infrastructure of stores around the world, because actually we now get um, people really engaging locally and then taking a sort of digital experience out, but we also, uh, it replaces those, in my view, quite wasteful shows. And there's so many fashion shows that tour the world and it just feels very um, inappropriate really. So it's rather nice that we get all this creativity um, locally and then we can, we can distribute that digitally. And you know, I wanted to be mean and sort of, you know, try to come out of this conversation saying, well, you know, it's the fashion industry, you know, it, it's only got this much influence and people, you know, it's only for rich people and it doesn't do that. And, and of course, you've, you've completely disarmed my every angle of attack and proven that, in fact, what you're doing is far, far more influential than anything that I could possibly do. So uh, I'm, I'm humbled. Well, I'm humbled by your knowledge. And the truth is we all learn from each other. And I think it's really important that I mean, my industry is a silly industry in many respects, but actually it employs a lot of people. Uh, it communicates widely. It has massive influence. So it's just trying to use the bits of it that we can together with people like you and all your amazing experience and knowledge and all the people I work with, the scientists and, the, and all the R&D to kind of get it together. Ultimately, we've got to club together on this. This is not about individuals. It's about collective actions. And um, I, I still remain positive just because it's a scary situation right now, but I still remain positive that we can make miracles if we all pull together. Well, hopefully this podcast and this YouTube uh, video will get your message to a slightly different audience. Um, a lot of policymakers, a lot of investors listen to this, a lot of you know the civic society leaders uh, in sustainability and climate change probably already uh, interacted with you and your brand and your thinking. But hopefully there'll be some new audiences that I've helped you to get to today. And uh, I just want to thank you for joining us. It's been absolutely tremendous. Thank you. I lost you a bit at the end. But yes, I just think the more we share all these problems and these thoughts, rightly or wrongly, openly, um, hopefully the better we'll do. Thank you very much for your time today. Great pleasure chatting with you. So that was Anya Hindmarch, fashion designer, entrepreneur and leading voice on sustainability. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share and subscribe to Cleaning Up or leave us a review on your chosen podcast platform. And if you want more from Cleaning Up, sign up for our free newsletter at cleaningup.live, where you'll find our archive of over 150 hours of conversation with extraordinary climate leaders. And why not help someone else learn more about the net zero transition by introducing them to Cleaning Up? Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gillardini Foundation.